Welcome to Write Good, the only podcast that helps you write good. I'm Raquel S. Benedict, the most dangerous woman in speculative fiction. With me today is Kurt Schiller of Podside Picnic. In addition to having way too many podcasts and raising some very spooky children, Mm. Kurt edits and publishes Blood Knife, an online magazine that examines popular culture from a leftist perspective. Since its humble beginnings, Blood Knife has found wide readership and has been referenced in major media outlets like the BBC and the New York Times. In this episode, Kurt is going to tell us the secret to his success. How do you start a magazine? How do you run a magazine? How, how do you make a magazine work? So thank you for coming back on the show, Kurt. Oh, yeah, absolutely. A- anytime. The answer to your question is often badly in, in terms of how, or possibly badly, but not so badly that it matters. There we go. We'll go with that. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, delighted to be back. Right. So why don't you tell our listeners, in case any we have any new people, about yourself? Who are you? So I am Kurt Schiller. I am a writer and podcaster and editor. And I have been uh, some of those things for over 10 years, some of them for only a couple of years. I do a couple of podcasts. I do Podside Picnic primarily. I also do a podcast about parenting from a leftist perspective called Parents Just Don't Understand with my good friend Chris, who's also on Podside Picnic. Uh, And yeah, and I I do uh, Blood Knife. I've also done a little bit of freelance writing elsewhere for recently for Seize the Press and and hopefully one other outlet that I can't I can't quite talk about yet because it isn't out, but probably will be by, by the time that this episode is. But yeah, I started Blood Knife in 2020 after the first couple months of COVID when I had an itching to do something and I, I picked an idea that I had been chewing on for a while, which was to write more stuff and publish other people's things. And I kind of went from from there. Yeah. I've talked about this in a couple places before. I gave a talk about kind of the process of starting Blood Knife through Flights of Foundry, which is an online conference that's part of Dream Foundry. I gave that, I think it was like late last year. I kind of screwed up and I gave it at one in the morning because I was trying to be cooperative and they were like, we have people from all over the world so you can schedule your talk for, for any time. So I was like, well, I'll say that I'm available until, until 2 a.m. Eastern time. And, and I said that and they scheduled me at 1 a.m. So <laughs> I've talked about this, but I, I don't know how many people have, have heard it. <laughs> Before we dive into it, could you tell those of us who might be a little unfamiliar with it, Tell us about Blood Knife. Like, what is the magazine's, I don't know, mission, if you want to call it that? Yeah. So, when I started Blood Knife, my goal then and now was to publish a much, to basically to, to run it as essentially a blog, but A, to never call it a blog for reasons that I'll, I'll talk about later, I'm sure. And, and B, to publish way less than a normal blog or digital magazine, but in doing so to A, compensate people fairly at much at a significantly higher rate than, than most online writing opportunities, and B, to put the quality much higher, basically, and only publish those slightly longer form think pieces and not do bullshit SEO content and the, t- topically the the goal was was and is to look at popular culture usually media usually genre media but sometimes you know you've you've written some pieces for us that that are only tangentially re- related to media you did a great piece on imposter syndrome really, that, that got a decent amount of, of attention and that really didn't have anything to do with media it's just cultural criticism so it's essentially a leftist cultural criticism magazine where we we use media and kind of cultural analysis as tools to look at why our world is the way it is, why we look at it the way we do, and why we make the sort of art that we make and why it has the the effects upon us that it does. So like a typical thing that we might publish is why is colonialism depicted in the way that it is on Star Trek? Why does Star Trek depict colonialism different in the old series and the new series and what does that mean about the way that we what, what we expect to get from science fiction what what does it mean about the way that we see different parts of colonialism as acceptable 
or not? Or what does it mean to look at horror films and see how the role that police play in them and how it's changed over the years? I find it really interesting to see the kind of topics and takes that people come up with. And it's given me the opportunity to publish some really cool stuff, which we do. We were doing about five articles a month. And to be perfectly frank, that burned me out a bit. So yeah, that's a I, lot. I'd say we're, yeah, we're, we're currently doing probably about three articles a month. And I'm, I'm working on some stuff to get the number back up. I wanted to sacrifice numbers instead of either sacrificing quality or uh, mental health. <laughs> yeah, because this is kind of a, almost a one man operation, it sounds like. I mean, you're doing this stuff and you're you're doing it for free. You're not getting a salary from this. I Correct. Understand. No, I don't. I don't take any money at all from it. We have a Patreon that brings in a, about eight hundred dollars a month and every penny of that goes to pay writers and, and, and artists. And whenever we've had more money, we've either added more content that we publish and bought more pieces effectively, or we've raised the rates of what we pay. We currently pay nine cents a word, which is a, a decent rate. I want it to be even higher. I actually should go look at at the book soon because given the fact that we've slowed down the the speed of publication, we actually probably can pay a little bit more now too. But yeah, I, I don't draw a salary from it. I wouldn't say that it's a one-man operation. There are three other people who who help me out. There is Trevor Drinkwater, who is the assistant editor. He helps me with a lot of the reviewing pitches. He'll give a second opinion on, on stuff. He'll do some of like, the first pass editing. Then there is our art director, Sam Hindman, who has also done a ton of, of illustration for us. And he kind of reviews artist pitches and he'll he'll help locate artists to do, you know, art for an issue or art for a particular article. And then there's a gentleman named Nick, who I, I don't know if he wants his full name used, so I'll just call him Internet Nick, who helps us out periodically on on managing like our Facebook page and he'll go and manage post stuff on on Reddit when we have an article that's a good fit and and he's helped us get a lot of traction on on stuff. And then of course we've used fiction reviewers periodically or i, I should say slush readers periodically right, when we've been right. intaking i read slush fiction. for a while yeah yeah you did you did a great job you recommended you. a couple of cool pieces and you also uh dis dis recommended many that that ought to be disrecommended <laughs> yeah, there, were some, there were some stinkers um yeah but no i i I would say that I do the lion's share of the editorial work, but there's definitely other important stuff that I either don't have the skill set or I just don't have the time to do myself. And and so I'm I'm always greatly appreciative of Trevor, Sam, and Nick for their contributions as well. Nice, nice. Well, why don't we get down to the beginning? You you touched on this, but why did you start Blood Knife? You said part of it was money you wanted to pay contributors fairly how much do other mainstream blogs pay i've seen pay rates for places like content mills really like screen rant and indie what is it called indie wire or something yeah there's like indie wire there's probably something called they're, 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 if, if you try to make up the it's name bad. of a shitty nerd blog it probably exists already <laughs> i'm just gonna say i don't know Sexy Robot. I bet that's a blog. Nerd Insanity. I bet that's a blog too. Geek Mania. I bet that's also a blog. Like oh yeah, that's the, the, be These a are blog. all probably real blogs that exist. <laughs> um, yeah, they pay uh, so bad, man. They pay if they pay at all. They they pay. It's it's really really highly variable. Very few of them will publish their rates. A lot of them won't even tell you that. Like there's this weird back and forth where I'm sure you've been through this, where, where you've pitched an article and it's been accepted, but they haven't mentioned payment, and you're like. Mm -hmm. are you going to pay me at all? What's going on? When, when are we going to discuss this? And and I think that one of the things that writers need to learn is just you kind of have to be the asshole and be like, so the money, what's the deal? But no, it, it could be anything from $0 to I would say probably $25 for a 400 to 800 word article is, is the norm and even getting on like the higher side. There's definitely, <sighs> I think, I forget if it was like, God, what, there was like a, there was like a decent sized publication recently. I think it was Screen Rant where it came out that they were paying like like twenty dollars for like a sixteen hundred word article. It was it was ridiculous. Right, it's really, it's really, these terrible, really terrible, terrible yeah. rates. And then and then you kind of understand. Well, that's why they get the quality they get because yeah, they're you're going to spend they're, 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 they're going to spend an hour on that yeah, so so we pay you generally a, about five to ten times what an equivalent length piece would get you at a lot of other publications of of our size and and even a fair bit larger although i i, I will say you know a, a lot of the larger old media publications often pay quite a bit better our original pay rate which was about i think it was like 
five and a half cents a word or something like that was based on what Jacobin was paying at the time wow. for freelance pitches. And so that was that was the baseline that we started at, and we've we've almost doubled it since then. Thank you to the generous contributions of our Patreon subscribers. Yeah, that's so that's so low, and the 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 sort of content they put out is, uh, oof. Well, I mean, you get what you pay for. I I I know you showed me the PowerPoint slides to a version of this talk you've already given, and one of the points was so much online writing sucks. Oh yeah, it's it's terrible. I I wanted to publish stuff that that didn't suck basically because let me go back a little bit. So I I have written off and on for a while about pop culture stuff. I used to have a blog with some coworkers at an old job called Geek and Freud. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i wrote stuff that's actually pretty pretty typical of what what blood knife would publish now so i wrote something about the way that police are depicted in the wicker man for instance was one of the first pieces of pop culture writing that i put on the internet and we did that for a little bit and then it, it, it kind of went away uh and a few years later i i watched this movie called called blood machines which was on shutter it probably still is on shutter and it's this weird very wet and sticky science fiction <laughs> film by i think it was directed by the synthwave artist uh perturbator no it's what it's it's one of the other guys but it's very french it's very sticky and wet there's a lot of weird neon robots and and weird spaceships that have that are powered by these women that have been imprisoned inside of it and it's about this salvage crew that goes around and kidnaps the women out of crashed spaceships and try, and makes them get into new spaceships it's a very strange film and i and i watched it and was like i want to write something about this but i don't know what to do with it i had a substack and i was like i I'm going to be able to write one Substack article every four, four months. No one's going to read that. Right. Um, and so it occurred to me that given that magazine, given that websites pay so badly, I, yeah. I could pay a lot more than that and still have enough to put out one article a week. So that was the original goal was like, I want to start a website that can put out one article a week. And I, okay. I I made up this whole this whole backstory about, oh, the reason it's called Blood Knife is because of the prop knife. It, it's all a lie. The real reason <laughs> the real the real reason is because I just watched Blood Machines. So I was thinking about blood. And I, I went on to the <laughs> domain name lookup tool and I was just going through different words that could go with blood. And it turned out that nobody had bloodknife.com.net or dot org. So, just so I basically went naming all. it in the way that a fourteen year old boy would yeah. name it. Like what's yeah. a word that's cool? It's got blood yeah. in it. What else yeah. is cool? I, uh, yeah, I was, cool. Like, I was like, it has to be easy to say. It has to be a little bit jarring and a little bit memorable and it, it can't be more than two words. So those were my criteria. <laughs> yeah, every time every time I hear the magazine mentioned in a podcast or something, the way they say the name is blood knife. That brings me so much I read so this article joy. in Blood Knife. <laughs> I love it so much. It's so great. And that was the intended effect, was a little bit of uncertainty. <laughs> yeah, it is better than Geektopia. Or, yeah, or you're not going to forget it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, some, something you've pointed out is that a lot of online writing sucks and it's all the same. It's hmm. basically recycled ad copy. The, the headline is pretty much a line from some kind of press release they even all use the same promotional image i think you showed articles from like kotaku io9 screen rant and a bunch of those other places and it's about it was about some new i don't know star wars show or something yeah oh yeah yeah image. it was the star wars book about like a samurai jedi effectively that was like, or, or or like a jedi ronin essentially yeah so so a, 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 i would say probably two-thirds of all blog content on pop culture blogs starts out as a press release and if if anyone's not familiar with with press releases they're basically a little canned pre-written stories that follow a very specific format that companies will send out about uh like news announcements usually a couple days before they happen so that the blogs and newspapers can have something r ready to go so if if you've got a new book you're about to announce you will get a piece of promotional art you'll come up with a headline abc books announces new sci-fi series from the author 
of the the Book of Stone and Groan or whatever. And you'll have two quotes from the author, a quote from the VP of Acquisitions about how excited you are about the new and soon to be successful thing you're publishing. And and it, this is usually the only source of information that is available about something because blog blog writers don't have time to go out and research stuff and like hunt stuff down. So typically you just get right. given a press release and it comes with the art and they're like, you have 45 minutes, write up 600 words on this. And so you basically just kind of mix and match the title within what you're given. You use the image that you were given. Maybe if you're feeling sassy, you like reverse it or something. So it's not exactly the same as everyone else. Maybe you make it black and white. And because you basically only have like six facts, right? And you have to stretch it out to a few hundred words. Everyone basically writes the same article. They all come out on the same day. If you go to the, yeah, if you go to the homepage of Kotaku, for instance, and you pick an article and you copy and paste the name of that article into Google and you click on the news tab, you'll probably find 20 other identical articles that were either based on that same press release or often if you're a smaller publication that's not big enough to attract press releases, you'll just look at Kotaku and just rewrite whatever they published and be like, okay, here it is. And our source for this is Kotaku. So it's like, you're doing like a photocopy of a photocopy thing at that point. And yeah, that's not even writing. That's just that's just copying and pasting and moving yeah. some words around. That's that's nothing. And that's probably yeah. 80% of the stuff that gets published on a given day uh, on the internet. And that sucks. Right. And I want to stress, I can't blame the bloggers. These are people mm. who are making yeah. jack shit wages. They've probably got to churn out like 10 of these today. You just go, whatever, just fart it out as fast as you can. I don't give a shit. Yeah. Like, and you're going to get there's 10 no way to make good it. writing under those conditions. Yeah, exactly. So I basically didn't want to do sh shitty glurge press release articles like that. So part of the idea was to limit it to articles that would be as relevant in a year or two as they are right now. Because right, cause, cause as soon as a Star Wars book comes out, no one's going to look back to your article because the book is out. What do right. you need the announcement for any anymore? The other funny thing is that a lot of corporate websites now have a little newsroom section that basically is written like a blog anyway. So you may as well just go read StarWars.com if you want Star Wars news. I don't even know why you would go read it on, on Kotaku unless you like the colors are a little bit different, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So from that mission, from that we're going to write about pop culture in a way that doesn't suck shit because most of it's terrible – how did you did you start this magazine? What did you start with? What did you know? A, I started with a press and a dream. How oh did yeah, you start so it off? Uh, so I started with a Google domains account that was important to buy bloodknife.com.org and .net. I forget how much that costs. It's not much. It's like ten dollars a year now or something to register a domain name, and you don't even need to use it. You can do so if you want to call something something, and you can afford ten dollars a year you should just go buy it because somebody else eventually will. And that's something that you can just keep and renew every year for $10 pretty much forever. So I, I had that. I had a Google domains account. I had a Gmail account and I set up a Bluehost account and a WordPress installation. And I forget, I forget how much Gmail doesn't cost anything. I forget how much the Bluehost account started. It was very low for the lowest tier, which I can't use anymore because of the the amount of traffic. But the the lowest tier was like maybe fourteen dollars a month or something. It wasn't a whole lot. Less than it's less or about the same as you would pay for like a streaming service month to month. Yeah, that's um, pretty cheap. Yeah, and then I went and bought Word WordPress uses these things called themes, which are kind of like little boxed and bundled up look and feel packages so you'll go you can go and buy a theme from a website i think there's stuff called like theme forest is, I, I think or v something like venado i totally forget and vato that that's it you know there's there's people out there who do nothing but design themes so there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them and i just went and looked for cyberpunk themes and i found one called i think it was called tetsuo and i bought it for like <laughs> 60 bucks and i know i i knew a little bit about uh, CSS and web design at the time. I know more now, but I basically just lightly customized it. That that took care of most of the homepage design and most of the on-page design. I messed around with the fonts and the colors a little bit. Uh, and that was basically it in terms of, of infrastructure. And it probably cost me, I want to say all in, starting up costs probably about $130, $150. Nice. And then on top of that, I had to, I had to, to buy some articles basically. 
So the actual infrastructure of starting a website like this isn't expensive. And it's much more just about looking and finding ways to be cheap in ways that don't hurt writers and don't hurt humans. I don't give a shit if, if Bluehost doesn't get my money, but I do care if I'm relying upon underpaid writers to run something. So I'd much rather cheap out a little bit on hosting and, and pay people more. That seems like a much better thing to do. And then I basically just put out a call on Twitter and to some to people that I knew on Discord and other places like, hey, I'm starting this thing up. Let me know if you're interested in writing something. Here's what we're paying. Here's I think we started with four 800 word articles a month uh, of which I was going to write one every month. That that hasn't happened. <laughs> um, but luckily, I don't need to do that. I write probably every I, I, probably, I probably write an article every three months or so now. But that was that was the start. And it took about. I want to say from, oh, and, and to Patreon, because I started that before we were live. And that was important because by the time we went live, we already had 30 or 40 patrons. Um, That's and cool. We, we had enough, basically the same month that we released our first issue to raise our, our rates. And we, we basically back paid all the art, all the writers who were in the first issue or maybe the first two issues and raised their rates after the fact and, and paid them the difference afterwards. Nice. So yeah, it's not, it's not super expensive. It was definitely a little bit labor intensive and it definitely requires like, like a month or two run up to, to let people know. I think one of the big mistakes that people make is like not talking about something. That was a hard mistake that I had to learn in the past. I put out a self-published novel one time that I basically didn't say anything until it was like, here it is. Oh, no. And oh, no. I think like three people bought it. I it, it's t it's been out for about ten years now, and I've I it took me about seven years to earn back the cost of of having the cover designed. Oh, no. <laughs> so yeah, so you know you you can start you you just say hey I'm doing this thing it's gonna come out in a couple months you can support us here for as little as two dollars or whatever and people will especially your friends and then you can grow yeah. beyond that. So yeah, that's cool. So in this talk that you've given a couple of times. You have a few points. What does a magazine need? What does a magazine want? And what goes into an article? So let's start off on what does a magazine need? Yes. So the first thing that a magazine needs is content, obviously, because you can't have a magazine. I mean, apart from like a website, somewhere to put stuff, you need stuff to publish. So we already kind of talked a little bit about that. Just as if you're presumably if you want to start a magazine, you probably are a writer or editor yourself. And if not, I, I would suggest going and becoming that before you do that a little bit first, before you try to start a magazine, because you're going to have to. A bunch of stuff will fall upon you one way or another. You pr probably do that for at least a little bit first. But if you have been doing that for even a little bit, you probably know a bunch of other writers and people like writing and getting paid for it, especially. So I, I would say just the first things first is ask your friends, ask writers you like, ask writers that you don't know, but you respect their writing. One of the early things that we were able to do is just ask people who I thought were good writers and I didn't really know. And I said, hey, we're starting this thing. Would you be interested in contributing an article to us? Hmm. And a lot of them didn't. Some of them did. Jamie Peck, who was of the Antifada and is now of Everybody Loves Communism, I think in our second or third issue wrote a nice little piece about like socialist witchy Halloween stuff for us and getting established writers and established people to write stuff means that they'll probably post about it and they'll probably say hey check this out and that draws a lot of attention to a small and new project and even people who are well known like getting paid for their writing it's it's surprisingly rare even yeah if well are a known yeah part. I mean just because <laughs> someone has a hundred thousand followers on whatever social media platform I mean you, you don't make money by tweeting exactly. so like actually getting paid for your work is like oh this is nice all right yeah and, I can and I can get paid in a way besides oh let me put an ad for a dildo after this viral tweet exactly yeah and and also one upside of the dildo companies is that apparently when they DM you it's they're typically like, hey, we'll pay you $40 if you do this, and, and then they pay you $40. And you can use that same strategy, minus the dildo, for writing. Instead of this weird bullshit of like, hey, can you pitch us an article? You could just say, hey, would you write us something? I'll pay you $50 and for 600 words and just get straight to the point. Uh, and that's an, op that, that's an advantage that as you know, a... a I'm, I'm presuming that if you're listening to this, you're at least socialist friendly. And I would encourage you to be more than friendly, but it's good to be upfront with labor in your limited yeah. capacity as a boss. And 
one of the benefits of that is you will not be doing the bullshit that every other publication is doing of being like, well, we might be able to pay you that. Just just tell people, here's the amount. Say yes or no. And if no, no hard feelings. Cool. Whatever. And that makes it very easy to say yes to. So, yeah. And, yeah. and that that it, it it honestly hasn't been hard to keep getting pitches. At this point, we just kind of get pitches from random people. We'll still solicit them, especially for themed issues. But yeah, early on, you you may need to go and hunt people down and kind of bug them of, of, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what it's like. It helps to have a reference point. I was really inspired by the outline. I was really inspired by oh, the outline. Oh, it was such a good magazine. Really great, great publication. R.I.P. Yeah, yeah. They were, t- and they, I believe they published Friends of the Pod, Gr- Gretchen Felker Martin. They did. She wrote a really good piece about the helicopter story controversy. That's right. Uh, of what's the also, Harmon reading? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's right. That's the one. Yep. Yep. They did one perfect. of my favorite articles from the past few years, which was what was it called? A decade of of sore winners, mm-hmm. which I go back to that story over and over and over again. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah. And and the, the, they were terrific, and they were relatively well known at the time. So, like when I was pitching people early on to write to write something for us, I would I would be like, Hey, we're trying to publish stuff like this. Maybe it can't be quite so long, but this. And I I would just send them a link to. Uh, Connor Southard wrote an article for them. For, for, former host, now host alumnus, I guess, of uh, Podside Picnic, wrote a great article for them, the, the topic of which escapes me. But I, I would literally just send people a link to his article and be like, we're trying to publish stuff like this. Would you be interested in writing something like this? And that, that helps because it gives people an idea of the style that you're looking for. And then once you have content, you'll also need to edit it. And that's where most of my time is consumed. Um, right. And editing is a whole is a whole other thing. And I don't think you need to be you don't need to be super consistent with editing. It's really extremely matters for someone like The New York Times to have a super consistent style guide because they have dozens and dozens and dozens of different copy editors and you need to have them all on the same page. If it's mostly just you doing the editing, it doesn't actually matter because you can change your mind and be like, I I, I feel like we're going to use less m dashes now so f- fuck it i i'm i'm fiating this into existence so you don't need to worry super like, like a whole lot about about a style guide although you should try to be consistent but a lot of a lot of the editing process is developmental editing of kind of going from that pitch to a first draft so we typically start with pitches instead of like full articles we will usually offer some recommendations like hey if you're going to write about this it would be a good idea to please try to include a couple a couple examples or for instance hey your your pitch only mentions uh video games can you add some non-video game examples of this media trend that you're talking about if it's like uh the way that america is more comfortable with violence than sex for instance like hey can you can you include stuff that's more recent than four or five years ago or can you link out to a couple articles or something or hey maybe maybe you, you can get a quote from an academic or at least cite a, like, like a paper or something like that. So we'll, right. you, you have to kind of equip writers to to succeed in the way that you want them to succeed, to succeed. And then you, then once you get a draft, there's usually a lot of structural editing of kind of like, hey, this section should probably come earlier. This section should come should, should come later. And a lot of that stuff you just kind of have to learn on the fly. Um, I worked as an editor for a couple of years in ages past. So I, I had a bit of experience at it, but it was definitely like, skill sets that I had to dust off. But honestly, if you're even thinking about it at this level, you're already editing much more intensely than any of those nerd blogs uh, are. So you're probably already, you're probably already well ahead of them. Yeah. Oh God. Now you said you looked, you reached out to some experienced writers or fairly well-known people, but I've noticed you also take a lot of pitches from first time writers can you tell us about how you work with first-time writers? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure this has been said on Write Good Book before, but the number one uh, source of success as a writer is has often often has nothing to do with the quality of your writing or your skills as a writer. There are, I am sure, thousands upon thousands of writers who are better than twenty to thirty percent, if not more, of all published authors. Just just because the main thing that you need to succeed monetarily as a writer is just to keep doing it and to get lucky. And so 
there's a lot of first time writers who are very good writers. They just maybe don't quite have the experience with kind of going through an editorial process. They maybe don't have the experience with pitching or they're just they've just been shy about it. They just haven't gotten around to it. So, yeah, we, we always encourage first time writers and some of our some of our best articles have been from first time writers or at least from first time published writers. And I typically find that if it's a first time writer, you usually need to spend a little bit more time interrogating the pitch and not interrogating like a hostile way, but something that something that I think often happens when you first start out writing nonfiction pieces is you'll you'll think you know what you're going to write. And you'll write a few hundred words and you'll kind of realize that either your idea was half formed or actually you meant to write about something else. So it's definitely good to kind of try to think through some of that with them or for them and, and ask a few questions like, is their thesis interesting enough? Because we, we look for right. two things. One is just, is it an interesting topic? And the other one is like, is it relevant? Basically, like, why should somebody care about this? Um, yeah, why should a- somebody care? And I've noticed you try to go for something that's not the, the super common, obvious take. Exactly. Yeah. The, the first thing that I do with the pitch is just Google the words in the pitch and see if the blog piece has been written before. And if there's like one other thing and it's not very good, then that that almost makes me more likely to go ahead with it. If I think that all the writing on a subject has sucked and somebody pitches me something that sounds good, I will I will 100% jump on that, even if it's been written hundreds of times before, because there's nothing like something that's been done badly suddenly being done right to make people come out of the woodwork. But a lot of times, first time authors will have something they're very interested in, but they haven't quite thought about like why somebody else would be interested in it. And right. th- there's usually a reason you just need to think of it. Like if if you publish something on a movie that came out 25 years ago, it might be a very good movie and the topic might be very interesting, but you kind of have to find a reason that you should care about it a little bit now. And there's, there's almost yeah. always a reason, right? But you have to kind of make that bridge for the reader. And usually yeah, you got to do something yeah. besides, hey, check this out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's, that's something that frustrates me a lot about, about even like some of the better written blogs, like pop culture wise, they'll just kind of be like, this is a forgotten film from 25 years ago. And usually it's not really forgotten. It's just, just not being talked about m- much. Right. And right. Th- that's not really a good way of making it interesting. You need to, you need to look at like, what are some things that people are doing now? And does this do something different? That's usually a good one. You know, is it something that I I've, I always like when Write Good talks about is is qu- queer art when the world was much much more hostile than even it is now towards queer people people who managed to make very very gay movies in like the sixties and seventies that's a great way to make something relevant if there's a topic that is that is that that is much more common now and there was a film sixty years ago that talked about it that's that's a terrific way to make something relevant because then you can be like. Why is it different? Why does it look like this? But that, yeah, the, with with first time writers, you you often kind of need to get out and and push a little bit. But also sometimes stuff comes in where it's just a straight up slam dunk. I've definitely gotten stuff. There, there there have been a couple of articles where people just emailed me completed articles out of the blue, and I published them almost as is. Um, nice. I'll never say which which ones because <laughs> one of my one of the things that I stuck to and try to as much as possible is that the editing process is kind of is like sacrosanct between writer. And editor. So there's definitely yeah. stuff that we have published where I personally rewrote a lot of the article and there's stuff that, that I have barely touched. And I, I think you kind of owe it to your writers to not give any indication. If you're the editor, you need, that's a big thing actually is you are not the focus. The writer is, is the focus. You need to shut up and let them write and just help them write, write as, as well as they possibly can and make sure that people read it. Yeah, definitely. And and something that you mentioned about first time writers, there is a lot of that not going through the system and just not knowing how to pitch. Like the first writing your first pitch is like, what? How do how do I pitch? How the fu- how do you fucking do that? But it's also if you're not a known quantity, you know, you pitch mm. everywhere. That doesn't mean you're going to get published. You almost certainly won't get a pitch accepted. And unfortunately, even if you are a known quantity, a hell of a lot comes down to do you know the editors? Yeah, which yeah. is such a bummer. Yeah, it's it, it it sucks, and I mean, unfortunately, we pass on way more pitches than we accept. Like any publication, there's definitely stuff that is just not quite the right time. I've gotten interesting stuff where, like, we 
whenever we have an article blow up, often one that you wrote, Raquel, we will get like 10 more pitches that are very similar. And I usually, I, I almost always pass on those just because I don't want to like, it's kind, it's kind of already been done. I don't want the magazine to be just about one thing. Um, yeah. And, if you and know it's another... kind of like lazily hop chasing a trend. It's exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Something that's kind of neat about Blood, Blood Knife is that Blood Knife seems more interested in setting new discourse instead of chasing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because you'll you'll never really get out ahead of discourse, at least not not by trying to chase the person that's already in the lead, right? Like you'll only ever be number two. And why would you want to be number two? You should go run a different race. That's my my confused metaphor for the evening. But yeah, yeah. My advice on pitching, whether it's Blood Knife or anything else, is uh, try to make it succinct. Like I want to write about blah, blah, and blah, blah. Give a strong example of what you're talking about. If you're talking about, again, if you're talking about depictions of violence versus depictions of sex, include why it's relevant. You know, in three months ago, the 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 film Crazy Sex Murderer came out to widespread acclaim. However, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, you want to indicate that you thought through why it's relevant, why someone would would want to read it and they give like a very abbreviated version of your argument and you can even say stuff like touching on academic research about the human brain's reaction to images of sex the the writings of Truffaut and the book the last girl or something like that i will explore this this and this and demonstrate how thing 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 is true for modern society it doesn't need to be very long most pitches should only be like a paragraph or two at most. And that it's it's still probably might not be be accepted. But the the main thing is just making it easy to say yes and give people a, an idea. What you shouldn't do when you're pitching is to email and be like, I have this idea for an article that's kind of about these two things. What do you think about that? That's usually that 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 just tells me that someone needs to think a little bit more about it because yeah. they're they're be, if you do that you're basically asking asking the editor to to tell you what, what to write about and and they're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now let's talk about the month to month running of Blood Knife. How do you put together each each issue? Like, what does the timeline look like? It's changed over time, but I generally try to have at least half of the articles for a given time period out being written about no less than two months before I intend to publish them. Sometimes stuff happens much faster than that, but that's that's more just, just accommodating for my kind of slow turnaround time. The shortest amount of time that I think you can reasonably turn a, a good longer form piece around is probably about two weeks because a lot of people have day jobs and will need like a couple days to think and chew on stuff and, and get back. I would say a month turnaround is much, much more comfortable. So typically I have a bunch of stuff where I've accepted pitches. I have a bunch of stuff that drafts have come in. I have a, and, and people are now waiting for my edits. I have a bunch of stuff where it's like edits are done and I need to review the final edits. And then I have a bunch of stuff that's ready to publish, but it's not quite time to publish yet. And I, I have a big Excel spreadsheet that I, I keep track of stuff in and I, I say, OK, this is I'm planning on this to come out here and I'm planning on this to come out in this issue. We used to be much more strict about, about issue releases and it required a lot of web design. So we, we, we switched to a much more of a rolling schedule where we only do an issue like every two or three months now, but we'll still release stuff like in between. And that's that's cut down on the workload for me a lot. And I, I think was a was a good decision all around. But that's made scheduling a little bit easier, too, because you can just look at what's on top of the pile and and put it out. And, and that's pretty much it. Our Patreon comes in month to month. I keep an eye, but not an obsessive eye on on how much is coming in. And I try to adjust how much we're buying for the next couple months. If we're doing a themed issue, I'll try to announce it at, at, at least like two or three months in advance so that people can think about pitches and send in pitches and, and I'll have time to kind of like structure stuff. Cause with themed issues, it's, it's a little bit tricky because like, you know, if you're doing the violence issue, there's a good chance you're going to get a lot of like similar pitches and you, you, you want to build out enough of articles that are around the same theme, but aren't exactly the same. And so that can sometimes take right. a little bit longer or sometimes 
it'll be getting a little bit down to the wire. We'll have three out of four articles that we wanted for an issue. And I'll, I'll just either have to write something or I'll just start nagging people that I know. Hey, would you be interested in writing this? (laughs) I remember you had to do that for the sex issue. You had, you said you had some trouble getting people to write for that one, which was kind of surprising to me. Yeah. I, I think maybe people didn't know exactly what we were looking for with that one, but yeah, I, I, I had to bug a few people. I totally forget who I wound up bugging for that. Um, was it Girls Guts Giallo? Was it her? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it was. It was. Yes. Oh my gosh. What's her name? She's she, she, she's amazing. Um, yeah. Annie Rose Malamay. Yes. Um, she is terrific. And she wrote an awesome piece about lesbian vampires. And yes. Yeah. So sometimes you just have to kind of like look at people and and poke around and try to find someone who will contribute something or, or just write something yourself is always an option too. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, that's basically the month to month running of it. We pay people by PayPal and Venmo. I try to pay as soon as, as soon as a final draft is in so that I'm not scrambling to pay people later because at that point you're going to use it, right? Like Right. You bought the piece, you edited it. There's been one, there's been a couple articles that we wound up killing after payment. And we just said, whatever, keep the money. Cause if you, if, if you only publish a few articles a month, it's not worth being stingy over it. And there, there's been a couple times where we had a disagreement with a writer and we just, we just walked away from the, from the pitch or they were unhappy for some reason. And we just said, okay, so we, we have a policy now where if a, if a piece gets canceled for whatever reason, before publication, but after a full draft has been written, we pay 50% of the typical fee. So we pay like four and a half cents a word instead of nine cents a word. Okay, that's um, not and bad. That, that, that was an important rule because we got into these weird situations once or twice before then where it's like, we're in this, we're in this uncomfortable dead zone of like, there, there's, there's no way out of this situation. And, and I don't think that us or me and the writer can come to terms about this and and it makes it much more easy to just be able to be like how about this how about we we pay you less than the full rate and you get the rights back and you can do whatever you want with it and we'll just call it even and and go our own ways and that that, that's made things a lot easier so i do think you kind of need to have some some contingency plans for stuff like that because sometimes people disagree however well-meaning Right. Maybe a writer decides like, no, I, I, I want to do it my way and it's not suitable for the magazine or. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there, there was some stuff where it was like editing disagreements or like timeline disagreements. There's been a couple of times when people really wanted stuff to come out right away. And, and it was it was a, it was an awkward discussion, but it's ultimately people have their own interests. We have their our own interests. So it, it feels better to be able to compensate to, to compensate people for their time, because if they've written a draft, they've they've certainly put put time in and it feels bullshit to just be like whoop sorry <laughs> thanks for yeah. the six hours of work or, or whatever something else is promotion is we spend a lot of time finding ways to promote without promoting because the, you don't want to obnoxiously spam everybody exactly yeah so like we will I, I would say the big three things that we do are one we have our patreon emails so when an article comes out we'll send out an email within a day or two to to patrons saying hey we, we, we've got a new article up that your contributions help pay for thank you so much you can go read it for subscribers we we try to make at least like half to a third of articles subscriber ex- exclusives for at least a week or two when we do a themed issue we'll put it out for for subscribers get access to everything right away for non-subscribers they get two articles and then we gradually unlock we always do a tweet about it I will usually retweet it from my account. Usually the writer will retweet it. I will typically retweet the retweet. If, if you wrote about something in a complimentary way, you can tag them. If you wrote about like a small indie movie and you tag them on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, they'll probably be very psyched and they'll probably be like, check out this cool piece about this. And that, that, that helps you. The one thing we don't do is pay for, any advertising or anything because i think it's a waste of money most of our traffic comes from twitter or google searches and much more of it is just from twitter and the best promotion is just publishing cool shit that people keep talking about like the everyone is horny um yeah Yeah, and every once in a while one of your one of your pieces really strikes a chord with people on like reddit or what was it what it was hacker news hacker Hacker news. news right 
the orange website, the bad orange website, as as it's called. Yeah, and you'll you'll get some weird freaks talking about articles, and you just kind of if it, we we usually don't engage with with them, po- positive or negative. If it's positive, right. we might we, we we might like the tweet. If it's very positive, we might retweet it. If it's people who suck, I'll just kind of ignore them. <laughs> yeah. If if weird chuds want to read the art the magazine and get excited about it, that's that's on them, and it doesn't. It's not hurting anybody as far as I'm concerned, as long as as long as they're not like, yes, this magazine publishes tons of awesome alt right stuff. That would be very concerning as long as it's not that um, I, I don't think you need to, to worry too, too much about the wrong people liking liking your magazine. If it's only the wrong people, I would worry about that, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what it looks like occasionally is something will come out and a good number of chuds will be like, well, these 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 commies i disagree with them they're filthy communists but they got kind of a point about titties and boobies yeah, or something I, like that i i love that yeah your your articles <laughs> have have gotten a few reactions like that in in, in particular i i have to say i always say this but but y- you personally are the single greatest contribution to to our growth in in terms of an individual action um wow. because yeah no because i i mean we probably get, I'm guessing that we probably get one to two new subscribers a month just from people seeing your article and being like, I want to subscribe to this. And that that helps to not have to worry about the attrition because we, we, we probably lose two or three subscribers most months also. We have about, oh, yeah. about, about 200 most of the time. And so if you put out articles that people like and they keep talking about, if, if a thousand people look at your website, maybe one or two will sign up. And that that doesn't cost you anything. And then they'll also maybe read the new articles and get excited about those. So it's those. So it's like it's like a constant like spinning reactor that you won't get if you're chasing SEO. Like, no, no one's one of the glurge that blogs. shit a month later. Yeah, because so one of the one of the big things is is what I call like site stickiness, where mm. like there's no particular house style to kotaku or io9 or nine gag or whatever whatever other websites there are right it's just whatever is in the news right now if you go to one of those websites for their review of the new marvel movie there's no real reason for you to stay on that website once you've read it right unless you really like that writer maybe you'll click around to some other stuff but you probably won't really strongly remember I often find myself not remembering where I read articles uh, and having to kind of hunt them down again because they, they, it's not identifiable. Whereas I like to think that if somebody reads something in Blood Knife, they're, they're, they're going to be like, oh, yes, that was a Blood Knife article. Much like another big inspiration for the way that we wanted that I, I angled the content was uh, the London Review of Books, which I don't always love. But they have a very particular style. It's very identifiable if you're reading one of their articles. And if you like that style, there's really nowhere else to get it. So you're going to re- it's weird reading their articles because they're so different. And you'll probably read a bunch more of them. So once you get to the site, you stay on the site. And it also looks mm-hmm. different. That's the other thing is we made the site look weird so that you know <laughs> when you're on our website and it feels a certain way and you'll stay on the website instead of just hitting the back button and scrolling th- through your phone some more, for instance. <laughs> right. Right. Now, what are some of the hardest parts about running Blood Knife? I'm constantly behind and <laughs> I constantly am making no. sense of being behind. What? Uh, I, I, my... I I am waiting for the day that Gmail auto suggests thanks for your patience or sorry for, sorry for the delay as the first line of of every email that I write because it's definitely at least half of them and part of that is that I have been improving at delegating but I'm still not very good at it so a natural restriction on the growth of the magazine has just been the amount of time that I have and how far behind I get on things and the hardest thing has been like trying to overcommit less. Like we made a big deal about 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 publishing fiction last year, and did, in my opinion, a really shit job of managing the managing the 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 submissions process and managing responses to people. And the slight, I just did a bad job of running the whole thing. And so I'm currently like reworking that process so that I'll be less likely to be so that I won't be as much of a personal barrier to it, knowing that my time is a limitation. And that's just been hard to to grapple with and to learn how to grapple with because mm-hmm. I'm just a person who can who can do one thing at a time really really hard and then remember all the other stuff that he's anxious about doing 
and that's that's unfortunate and i feel bad for what i've put people through and they've been very very patient for which i am always thankful so uh that's been hard I'm trying to think what else has been hard the first time we had a couple articles that really blew up at the same time the whole server f- fucked up uh like our oh, shit. our hosting was not adequate so like i was on the phone with our hosting company at one in the morning and i was like the new york times just linked to our website and all these people are reading the magazine and i they're getting 404 is that people are going to just copy and paste the article and post it somewhere else and then they'll never know it was from us and so there was like a, a frantic conversation of can we upgrade can you move us to a different like server cluster that has more bandwidth and then I had to learn about PHP configuration because it turned out there was a variable set somewhere where we could only serve so many simultaneous clients and some other tech bullshit. That was tough, but but thankfully now that it, that doesn't really come up. Managing a backlog of articles is definitely tricky. The hardest thing I've had to do recently is figure out how to pay somebody who was in India, who was a really terrific artist who worked with us. And it turns out that wiring wiring money from America to India is really difficult and you need to learn a lot about the international banking system to be able to do it. Oh, what a pain. <laughs> yeah, that that that's super it super sucks and for, for for whatever reason you can't use Venmo and Cash App and stuff to circumvent it. So that's that's tough. The other thing is just I think staying committed to articles that you've accepted that finding a way to make them into the article that you know that they that they that they can be is it can, can be tricky sometimes as an editor. And not to say that like articles come in in bad shape because they don't. I, I'm always forever impressed with the people who who write for us. But like sometimes it's definitely like you sit there hitting yourself on the head of being like, should I know that something about the beginning of this article is off, but I can't figure out what I need to sleep mm-hmm. and think about it. And then you rewrite it and you're like, no, I, this was wrong. It actually should be a different way. And you have to revert all the edits. And that's definitely just like on a month to month article to article basis is always is always a challenge. That's probably the hardest stuff about it. Honestly, we haven't really had to worry about revenue much because we just kind of scale things up or down based upon how contributions change. So like if we get a little bit less one month, we'll do a few less illustrations or something, or we'll, we'll publish slightly shorter articles until we get some more subscribers again, but it's been, it's been pretty normal overall. I I think that's the, those are the hardest things. Right now. Let's talk about the the reach. Roughly, how many hits does Blood Knife get a month, and how does that compare to other sci-fi fantasy publications? We get this month is a is a big has has been a big month because we've had a few articles that that went viral or semi-viral. So this month we got about fifty two thousand hits currently. So it'll probably be like fifty five thousand by the time that it's done. That probably translates into, I'm guessing, around probably something like seventeen to 25,000 unique readers per month. Because hits are often one person reading three or four pages. It's not 52,000 people. It's definitely people. a good thing. What's that? Yeah, Which yeah, yeah. definitely a good that's, thing. That's definitely a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's... Uh, our readership is, is most months is between 12,000 individual people and 30,000 I- individual people. Typically when we have a big viral article, it'll, it'll go up dramatically because like a lot of people will discover the magazine for the first time as to how that compares. We are a lot smaller than a site like tour, which, which gets in the millions of, of views and visitors per month. But, I'd say we're on par or a little bit bigger than probably most SFF fiction magazines. There's one or two that I I, I think Clark's World gets. The, the, there's this annual roundup that gets published with different people will share their their page counts, and ba- based upon that, we're about on par or a little bit larger than than most of the SFF magazines that are out there. And I I would venture to say that we're or massively smaller than something like uh, Kotaku. Um, oh yeah. But but we're probably we're probably bigger than a site like n- you know, I don't know, Nerdwaggler or whatever the hell it's called. <laughs> now, how did you grow readership? Because just just because you put out good content doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to read it. I mean, you have to somehow get lots of people to read it. So how did you go from here's this new thing to, oh, holy shit, we're getting a lot of visitors suddenly. So 
for the first about five or six months of the magazine, we had very few visitors. Like, I think I think our first month where we got more than a thousand was the third issue or so, like more than a thousand page views. So that that sucked to look at that number and be like, well, I'm just going to not think about this. And so that's my first thing to, to, that I always tell people is if you start a new online project, you have to be prepared for nobody to notice it for six months. That's usually, for whatever reason, it seems to take about six months for, for people to notice stuff and for stuff to start to grow. And I'm sure that's a combination of something to do with Google rankings and something to do with just, a, I don't know, a critical mass of people noticing it. The biggest way that we grew it initially was by getting known quantity people who were good writers to contribute. So I mentioned Jamie Peck already. Leslie Lee III of uh, Struggle Session wrote a couple of articles for us that were awesome. He wrote one about H.P. Lovecraft. That, that yeah, was that one terrific. was really good. Yeah, that was really cool. It was about H.P. Lovecraft and the, the unfortunate TV show Lovecraft Country. And so that drew a lot of attention to the magazine because if, 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 if there's a writer who writes about a particular topic especially well or is especially known for opinions on it, then probably the people who follow them on social media are also into those same topics. And so if you have them write an article about it, all the people who follow them are going to be excited to read it. And then and then if your magazine is any good and you're publishing other interesting stuff, hopefully they'll stick around. That was a big initial source of growth. And then after about five or six months, we started getting some of our first like somewhat viral articles. And I, I want to say it was our first month that we broke 10,000 was about Six months out, I wrote an article about Ian e M. Banks and the culture novels that got picked up on Hacker News. Right. Because um, we were basically busting on Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. And uh, <laughs> uh, weird libertarian programmers are of mixed opinion about both of those gentlemen. And they love they love weird science fiction space stuff, as it turns out. And so that got a lot of uh, attention on the site. Not all of it positive. And then there's another article that is totally escaping me. But then then your article on everyone is beautiful and no one is horny really blew up. And that that took us from getting 10,000 a month to I think that month we probably got like 200 something thousand visits in, in that month. Yeah, I know. He, she should was very be. proud of this magazine. Yeah. He's saying, good for you. <laughs> and then it, it tapers off, but it's never it's never tapered off completely. People, There's a few articles now that are out there that people people repeatedly talk about. Your, there's like two of your articles that are like that. There was a, a uh, Gnostic Horror. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that one. By, um, buh, 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 buh. Uh, I'm totally blanking here. I'm so bad at like people's. You publish these. Names. You should know what they're called. K Halloran. Kurt. Hey, K hey, Halloran. I know people's Discord names. I don't know. <laughs> it's not even the names. I know people's Discord like avatars and they're they're like email avatars. Well, and that's it's written what I by a guy who who has a picture of Zangief. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's written by that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kay Halloran wrote this, this excellent piece on Gnostic horror that still gets talked about periodically. And so we have stuff that just kind of makes the rounds now. And as you yeah, build how, up, how to summon the devil? It sounds like has gotten. Oh, that's got that. It, if you search on Google for like how to let, let me just double check how to summon the devil. It is now. It is currently the second res, the second result on Google after that's demon summoning in the supernatural fandom wiki so it goes back and forth between like first and second um that's cool yeah so like we get google traffic from that basically what happens is as you publish memorable articles people will remember them and keep talking about them and you'll see them you're, you're basically building up like the floor right so our floor if we put out nothing our floor is probably 12 to fifteen thousand, i would guess for the month just from stuff that we've already got out there from people looking at it and it's very rare that we don't publish anything in a month but it it, it did happen once I, I think and we still got in the teens of thousands so That's just cool. as you publish more memorable stuff that that goes up and up and up gradually over time and there's a rollover effect right where like as you publish more good articles people will read that and go oh i wonder what other articles are on this site and then they'll see another good article and they'll read that and so the more stuff there is the the more the site gets gets read it just kind of grows but if, if you don't publish good stuff, it won't it won't grow is or you'll have to, like, force it to grow and do weird, shitty ways. 
Now, how long did it take for you to get into the black? In other words, to stop operating at a financial loss? About a year before we, but but, but that 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 was self inflicted, to to be honest, because we we raised our so so our first goal was I wanted to raise our rates to at least eight cents a word was like a number that I had in my head. And so we, we raised our rates f- faster than we were bringing in r- revenue. So, so basically I, which I, I view as like reinvesting in, in the magazine effectively, it was about a year before we, we, we reached the amount that I was comfortable paying and we just, we didn't increase the amount of, uh, stuff that that we published, and I let it kind of break even. And again, that was that that happened shortly after your uh, sex article came out. We were we were getting close, and that that really pushed it over over the edge. But I, I would say, I'll be totally honest. I I was burning about a hundred and sixty dollars of my own money a month when we started, which I don't think is that bad because we we were paying at the time about forty dollars for an eight hundred word article. And mo- most of our articles are longer now, and we pay a bit more than that. I think we would probably pay about seventy dollars for an eight hundred word article now. And so you, you kind of have to be, you have to be ready to to lose a little bit of money. But to my mind, it was worth one hundred and sixty dollars a month to put articles out there that I wanted to read anyway. Um, yeah. And I had it, so I spent it on that. And and so, th- but but yeah, n- now it's it's self sufficient, and I don't really. I mean, I. I subscribe to my own magazine, so I put ten dollars a month in. But apart from that, I don't put any money into the magazine, or at least it's not losing me money personally any longer. It's nice. all from 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 a Patreon now. Nice. I think Patreon, as sh- shitty as it is in some ways, solves a lot of problems for revenue collection for a project. Yeah, like definitely. This. But yeah, and I, I mean, I, I'm sure you've been th- through the same thing with Right Good, where it's like. Either you can worry about credit cards and a mailing list and all this other bullshit and signups and unsubscribes and blah, blah, or you can just use Patreon and just deal with the fact that they're not perfect and they're kind of annoying in some ways. I have to say, though, I posted in a in an editor, a magazine editor mailing list one time, and I was complaining a little bit about the cut of Patreon, which comes out to like around 17%, I think, after taxes and all their all their extra bullshit fees. And the reaction that I got was, you only pay 17% to your platform pr- pr- provider? That's nuts. Because the stuff like like Amazon Newsstand or whatever it's called, and those kind of digital publishing platforms often take as much as 50% of the yeah. cover price. So paying Patreon 17% isn't, isn't that bad. Uh, all said no, and done. that's not so bad. I would encourage people to use it until you feel like dealing with the the bullshit of getting off of it. We'll need to move off of it at some point, but not but not yet. And it'll be a pain in the ass when we do. Yeah, you got to be really big to the point. I think mm-hmm. it's not anyway. worth the, the seventeen percent, no, which not, for us is about. Right God, I I don't know. That's like sixty dollars a month, maybe. I'll pay sixty dollars a month. That isn't even my money, so that I don't have to deal with that bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're I mean your Patreon it says it's seven hundred and ninety dollars a month. That's not Yeah. That's not a ton. That's it's not it's that's not, not, a lot. not that's not worth the extra hassle. Oh, oh, if I can give one more piece of advice, you have to ask people to subscribe. You don't have to be a pain in the ass about it, but you have to remind people. Like put a button that says subscribe, yeah. mention that you can subscribe. Even if you don't get even if people don't get anything from it, what what I so something I found is that people People may subscribe because they want to get a thing, but they'll stay subscribed usually just because they they just like supporting something that they enjoy. Like people don't yeah. like some people definitely are like, I want this thing and I've gotten this thing and now I'm now I'm now I no longer want it anymore and now I'm done. But in my experience, people just people just like to support stuff that 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 they like. So it's not it's more of a vote of confidence than it is like a business transaction in exchange for goods and services so I, I would keep that in mind and also just again you just have you have to ask people to subscribe or they won't so put the patreon yeah, link yeah. in places and remind it them. doesn't have to be obnoxious but usually when i put a when i put out a twitter post or something on the right good twitter just saying like hey subscribe usually at least one person does yeah exactly like really that's yeah. all i gotta do and you is just say please you subscribe need that and to someone a will. bunch of times and then people people usually stay subscribed too for a year or two in my experience 
So. Yeah, yeah. Some people will like st stop after a few months or, or whatever, but it's ebb and flow. It's not yeah. that big a deal. Um, Tidal gravity, ebb and flow. Sorry. So let's talk a little bit about the influence Blood Knife has had. I, I know you started this magazine because you want you saw the state of publishing, especially about pop culture, especially about geek culture, and just what a disappointment it was. Mm -hmm. Do you think Blood Knife's relative success, or at least the fact that some of its articles have gone viral and have gotten a lot of attention, do you think that has had any kind of influence on other platforms, on other blogs, on the way that people might start writing maybe a little bit i think that the biggest influence it's had is allowing stuff it's like giving a spot for a certain type of article that people wanted to write but they couldn't get published anywhere and i i, I think that these kind of swing for the fences weird pitches i i love accepting weird pitches where it's a weird fucked up concept. Like I'm going to look at what it means to be human through a 17th century illustrated encyclopedia of bugs or something completely bizarre and off the wall. I love stuff or, like that. Or I really liked Maddie's topic, which was comparing sort of gender in portrayals of Faustine yes! bargains. Yes! That's a really fun, that's a really interesting topic. And it was something I hadn't, I haven't seen yeah. that explored before, but when she mentioned it, I'm like, hey, yeah, you know what? It made perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. As soon as I got that pitch, I was like, that makes perfect sense. It's about it's a it's about a dude who does a bunch of stuff and then and gets ultimate power and then does a bunch more stuff because he like wants this woman in like a weird fucked up way. And, and yeah, it's a very gender story. There's a lot of there's a lot of gender up up in that story. And yeah, I, I had never seen it written about. So I, I think that's probably the biggest influence is just giving, getting some of these articles out there in the world that probably wouldn't be otherwise. I but but there's clearly an audience for them. There's clearly an audience. A couple of them have really blown up. People people like reading this stuff. There's an audience of weirdos out there who have real big brains who like fucked up weird movies and comics and video games and and there's there's a lot of smart fucked up people out there and i i hope slash would like to think that that's our audience is like smart fucked up people yeah. <laughs> i think you should never become convinced of your own importance so i'm i'm i i i would say largely no probably hasn't had much of an influence <laughs> i will say that a couple people have me very nice stuff about how they were starting a project and they were inspired by why what we were doing. That's always very nice. And so I, we, we've definitely, I, I've definitely gotten a couple messages like that. So there's definitely some people who saw what we were doing and were like, I want to do something similar. And oh, that's, there was, that's there was cool. that weird little zine called, I think it was very online. That was cool. That yeah. was inspired by that short flash fiction piece by June that you published. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or at yes. least part of it. Cause I remember when they were soliciting, they were looking for submissions and they had a list of like, here's the kind of story we want. And one of them was June's story. I sexually identify as the, I sexually identify as a helicopter controversy. Yes. Yeah. 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 And that was super cool. We got a, we got a great reaction to, to that story. And that was a cool piece stuff. That was a very cool piece to, to, to publish. Um, yeah. I like that. That was your first published. That was our first work of fiction piece of too. It's just basically <laughs> announcing if you're a fucking dipshit, you're not going to write for I, us. I heard that somebody, I, I heard through the grapevine that there were one or two people who, who were mad that, that we published something like that and said something to the effect of, well, I guess you can tell what kind of publication this is to which I say, I, I hope you can. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this is, I don't this know is where you're like the bearded Chad guy, Wojak going. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think I think apart from that, probably not really. And I, I, I mean, if all of a sudden every blog was filled with delightful articles that I was like, damn, I wish I'd gotten to, to publish this, then I would consider my work done. But unless that happens, I'm going to keep publishing stuff. So so yeah, I don't expect that to, to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Maybe someone will put a bunch of I don't know acid and and MDMA in the water supply, and then and then maybe yeah. maybe a cosmic ray will bombard everyone's brains. <laughs> yeah. Or more likely, Tor will yeah. keep trying to produce watered down copies of your articles. I ah. know they did one for everyone is horny. They did one for the Gnostic horror. That's a type of influence. Is is copycat articles? I definitely saw a ton. I feel like in the week after your 
sex article came out, I feel like every website from the New York Times, which is a website, on, on tour, everyone did some kind of a copycat article. Some of them cited you, Ross the Boss Douthat, uh, for all his yeah, his many which crimes. Which was not what I expected to you ever and, see. And, That's and crazy. I was to very me. happy that he did that. Yes, that was that was nuts. <laughs> what a strange man he is, and has God, many bad so opinions. But he did he did you a solid there? I have to say. I yeah I get he, I I gotta I, I I gotta hand it to him for that. <laughs> but I think to an extent, unless people are being very egregious, he can't really do much more than than grouse about it and be a right. little bit sarcastic on on Twitter. My point of view is that if people link back to the original article, then hey, yeah yeah I mean like we both know that ninety percent of content mills is just imitating other people, and I feel like as long as you include a link to the thing yeah. that you're that you're sort of riffing on, like okay, that's it's fine. fair, it's fair, and honestly, if everyone's talking about an article, ultimately they'll go read the original one anyway. So, uh, but like yeah. whatever, maybe that's another form of influence, I guess. Yeah, right, Harley. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we're we've been talking uh oh, well over an hour. A while, yes, Once, for a while. Running a little bit longer, <laughs> and I'm guessing you you have things to take care of. Um, uh, I actually don't really. I am temporarily unemployed this week because I I yeah. finished one job and I'm starting another one next week. You um, got that cookie pie, so you have I got fulfilled the cookie your pie. obligations for yes. today. I got the cookie pie. I finished a a a, a secret project that I was working on that is done. And so I'll probably just go play video games, but I am, I am getting tired great. and less coherent. <laughs> yeah. So I should log off because it is cat treat time. Mm -hmm. So I and that cookie pie kids. is calling my name. Yeah. You got to eat that cookie pie. All right. <laughs> so before we go, where can our listeners find and support you? Bloodknife.com and patreon.com slash blood knife. And if you pay me enough money, you can request a themed issue and it can be totally stupid or it can be really intellectual and cool. We published a Satan issue earlier this year, yeah, and someone requested, metal. can you do an issue about Satan? And I said, anything about Satan in particular? And and the response was, nope, just something about the big man, quote, unquote. <laughs> the big man. And I said, all right, I can do that. <laughs> well, thanks to that person. It was it was it, it was it was a cool issue. Yeah. Yeah, it so, was. Yep. It was really good. And uh, I'm I'm on Twitter. The magazine account is at, at Blood Knife Mag, and I am on there as at Mechanical Kurt like Mechanical Turk, but with the letters swapped around because that's my name. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on and and telling us about the ins and outs of running a successful indie internet magazine. Yeah, absolutely. And and if anyone has questions or wants advice or whatever, feel, feel free to annoy me by by email or DM or whatever. I think my DMs are probably open. They usually are. You can email me at Kurt at bloodknife.com. Kurt with a K, knife also with a K, and um, dot com with a C. So feel right. free to email me and, and uh, pester me. Well, thanks very much. And thank you all for listening. That's all for this episode. If you like what you heard, head to patreon.com slash write good and subscribe. Until next time, keep writing good. This has been Right Good with Raquel S. Benedict. Hosted by Raquel S. Benedict and produced by Matt Keeley for KS Media LLC. Theme song by OK Glass. For comments and concerns, please write to us at writegood at kittysteezes.com. That is R-I-T-E-G-U-D at kittysteezes.com. you'd like to support us, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash right good. This has been a Kitty Sneezes production. KittySneezes.com in color. And that's my cat throwing a fit just for, <laughs> for no reason whatsoever. That's what that thumping is. She wanted to get into the closet. Very good, honey. I hope it was worth it. It, it wouldn't be a podcast without her. Oh.